Hello and welcome to another episode of the Golden Hour Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mays, and today I have Tom Buck, uh, who is now a new friend of mine. Tommy Boy, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, you're welcome. I forgot that you named this Tommy Boy, which is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not like the height of filmmaking, but I think I've probably seen <laughs> height it of more comedy. Than, I've probably seen it more than any other movie, like literally probably over a hundred times. Uh, just, <laughs> it's amazing. It's my movie. So if um, if Gerald Undone is purple, you are blue. Yeah. Um, and purple. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, your branding, I think, has always been on point. And like, I don't know what it is, but I guess now it's even more like intense and awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> how yeah. deliberate is that? Like, is it just something you're like, oh, this will be fun? Or like, was that something that you always planned on doing, like finding a color? I mean, blue's just like Tommy Boy's always been my favorite movie. Blue's always been my favorite color. And there you uh, go. <laughs> it's crazy because there was a time I really remember this like pre YouTube. This was in college. I would just if there was something I was going to buy, I would get the blue version of it. And I literally had a couple of people say to me, like, you need to tone it down with the blue. <laughs> like, it's too much. And it really got to me like that's a really goofy thing to say, but it really got to me. And then for uh -huh. a while, I would consciously not choose the blue thing. But I like blue, like it's what my eye is drawn Own to. It. <laughs> yeah. And so YouTube was a good chance where it's like, well, this is my channel and my thing and I can do whatever 100%. I want. So I'm going to put in blue and like, I'm just going to go for it as much as I want to, because that's the whole point of YouTube. And it just kind of worked out because it ended up being, you know, recognizable and it's a bright oh color. Goodness. It looks good on camera. Thank God. If it, my favorite color were like a color that didn't look good on camera that would be awesome. <laughs> like a, a barf green or something <laughs> yeah, that would... love burnt avocado it's just <laughs> yeah that's awful um no that's cool that's cool um i don't know why that's the first thing i asked you but uh um, it's fine <laughs> it's just... <laughs> when i think of uh your channel when you look at your thumbnails and stuff it's like blue everywhere which i think is actually a very clever and smart thing to do um because you instantly no, like oh this is a tom video yeah and same for gerald right like he's right. got the set and potato jet had the yellow um paper backdrop for a lot of his yeah as well it's funny. So. i literally today just got a yellow paper backdrop that i hung up um because it's another color that pops really well and i forgot that it was potato jet's background until you just said that <laughs> right well, now caleb pike uh, also does yellow backdrops on his channel as well so um, I don't think it's not, it's a non-exclusive color. You can, right. you can use whatever color you want. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, if you're not familiar with Tom's channel, he's got almost a hundred thousand subs. Um, let's get him there. If you're listening yeah. and you haven't subscribed, you're right at 90,000, yeah. uh, which is awesome. Um, I want to mm -hmm. hear about your whole journey on YouTube, but you kind of cover, um, a lot of pro audio and video cameras and gear, mm -hmm. um, roadcaster stuff. Um, I've discovered your content just based off of the YouTube algorithm, like suggesting when I was looking up uh, podcast stuff, oh, yeah. when I was considering um, getting back into the Canon world because you like had a whole Canon EOS R oh, like, yeah. period of, of your life and now you're all Sony. <laughs> so I definitely yes. want to nerd out about all that stuff. Oh, yeah. But. Um, and you also mentioned that you're a listener of this show, which I'm flattered by. So, Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, I've listened to, I think, most episodes. I'd love to say every episode, but I know I've missed a couple, but most of them. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, well, it's, thank you. It's such no, good that's okay. fun conversations. Yeah, you don't have to listen to all of them. It's <laughs> not a... <laughs> In fact, um, it's kind of like Lost. I don't know if you ever watched Lost, but mm -hmm. there's a couple episodes where it's like, that was a filler. That was a filler episode. <laughs> I mean, we've all you know? done, you know. <laughs> Yeah, we've all done that. If you got a podcast, it has to happen from time to time. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I'm contracted under, you know, with with Polar Pro on this show. So <laughs> it's a weekly show, whether I like it or not. So <laughs> right, right. Um, which I've actually genuinely enjoyed because to be honest, I don't think I would be here if I didn't have a contract. <laughs> so. Yeah, you kind of need those like those things to push you sometimes to just, I don't know, give you structure and so easy exactly. to put things off and exactly so let's talk about your channel and also just you in general like i can if i <laughs> sure. sort by oldest um uh -oh. you started the channel four years ago which isn't that long ago but four years ago you started mm -hmm. um 
In fact, three videos after your first one is called Golden Hour in the Desert. Oh, look it at is. That. Golden Hour. Yeah. See, it's um, brand. It all serendipity meant to be. <laughs> but looks like you're doing some vlog stuff back oh, yeah. in the day. But then it, it really wasn't long before you seemed to kind of click into what you're doing now, honestly. Um, you were doing some different tech things here and there. But just tell me about your journey on YouTube and kind of how you got started and uh, just your background in video production in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I think like you, I've just kind of always been like a camera nerd, an audio video nerd. It's just sort of, uh, it's just sort of a thing. Like I, I was young enough to be using eight millimeter camcorders as a kid. And you just sort of get whoever's around you and like put them in front of the TV and the VCR and like watch this thing I made. <laughs> and yeah. as time went on and cameras got better and and then the internet showed up and you could share it with everybody. It was just, it was amazing to me. So I've always been excited about that. Um, and I've like, you know, I, my first job was at a local TV station and I've all done like freelance stuff. But uh, my main career was as a high school teacher. And then I, I became a high school media teacher. So oh, I was teaching okay. like, that was super fun because it's all digital media and I had a budget <laughs> and, you know, yeah. students are excited <laughs> to learn about stuff. So we could order like anything we wanted and uh, teach kids how to use it. But the problem was doing that. I, I like wasn't making anything of my own. I was sort of just teaching others and doing like corporate videos for school districts and things, but nothing that was like my own. And yeah, in like 2011, as... 2012, I was like, YouTube would be fun. And then I waited oh, till okay. 2017 to start it. For some reason, I just got scared <laughs> and waited yeah. like five years. And uh, 2017, I was like, it was Casey. It was Casey Neistat. Like my students introduced me to him. I loved everything that he did and he made it feel accessible. Like you could watch a Casey video and go, I think I could do that. Like it's not perfect, you know? <laughs> it, it's totally. obviously there's there's a mastery to what he does, but the videos have flaws to them. The camera's crooked. Things are out of focus. The yeah. sound can be off. And you're like, oh, I don't have to spend four months on one video. That was kind <laughs> of a breakthrough. And uh, totally, totally. Yeah. And so that was what pushed me to start a channel. And it was the summer of 2017 that I started it. And, and I did like experiment. I think I did. I did a few random videos. And then I met uh, the girl who would become my wife on YouTube. <laughs> oh, really? Very cool. And because she was she already had a YouTube channel and she was kind of the one who was like you should you should have a channel like it's not stupid it's something you should do and wow that's cool yeah and I so that, that that pushed me to go okay i can just upload videos and i did like 30 videos in 30 days and it was a lot of vlog stuff and just figuring it out and learning how to create stuff and be okay with imperfections and uh then it was probably like eight or nine months before I was I was scared to like make camera videos or make audio videos because I thought there were already enough of those channels. And mm -hmm. what could I do? But it is what I like. It's, I don't get tired of talking about it. So I figured if that's something I don't get tired about, that's what I should make the channel about. And uh, then it, that's when things kind of started like, oh, this makes sense. And I'm good at it. Well, I think I think I could be good at it, I guess. <laughs> and people are like, you know, you start getting comments. They're like, thanks, this was helpful. Like, I appreciate this. I like this. And you're like, okay, I feel like there's something here. And kind of just yeah. that's sort of how I found the direction that became what it is. That's amazing. I Are you still teaching too? No. Uh, this past week was my one-year anniversary of moving into full-time YouTube from teaching. Oh, wow. Which is crazy. How was that? How has the last year been for you um, going from basically a career of being a teacher that I assume you went to school for to yes. now? <laughs> got a master's YouTuber. degree to teach on YouTube or to work to do a YouTube channel. It's <laughs> the best. And uh, I I loved everything I got to learn with teaching. But like I haven't set an alarm in a year. So that's the biggest <laughs> that's perk not... in the world. I still up before 6 a.m. most days, but on my okay. terms <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> that's like been my lifelong dream um it's been amazing like honestly just the opportunities getting to do creative stuff i'm the last person i would ever think to be self-employed or do anything like that and uh it's it's incredible it's a thing that can happen like the internet's kind mm -hmm. of magical that it lets you do that stuff 
And tell me about your wife. Like, how did you guys meet? And tell me that story. Because that's kind of crazy that you met yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, totally the algorithm, right? That's like what it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Need a wife? The algorithm is there yeah, for Yeah, it you. knew what I was looking for. No, it was uh, because... YouTube started as a dating website. <laughs> it did. So we we fulfilled its original purpose. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so she quit her job working at a school in 2016 to start her own business. And she just started like a vlog on YouTube to kind of document whatever she was doing. She was just figuring it out as she went. And so I, a year later, was starting my channel and super inspired by Casey. So in 2017, if you started a YouTube channel and you liked Casey Neistat, you definitely got interested in boosted boards. So I was searching up boosted board reviews and she had one. Uh, and the thing that I liked about her review, it was like her unboxing thing. And the first part mm -hmm. of the video is her in her apartment waiting for it to get delivered. And she's like waiting all day for the UPS guy. And she's like nervous and excited. And then finally, the UPS guy shows up and she like opens the door and she's like, oh, yeah, hey, what's it? like plays it super cool. Like <laughs> she wasn't waiting all day for this thing, <laughs> um, which I just because that's what I do. So that I yeah. thought that was funny. Um, and and then it was yeah, it was crazy because. Yeah. And and like speaking of the algorithm, so the next video that played was her talking about like the importance of digital literacy and teaching people how to use digital media because that's kind of what she had done prior. And I was like, that's what I do. And then like the next video was an Iceland packing list. And I had literally just booked a trip to Iceland. And I was like, oh, my goodness, these are just very weird things. So <laughs> I left my very first YouTube comment on her channel. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't like creepy guy on the Internet, but it was her digital media thing. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, I'm a high school digital media teacher. This is so important. It's really cool to see this in the real world, like the real world. Mm -hmm. um, and then she reached out to me and she was like, you're you teach this stuff like you have a program. And I was like, yeah, we have a whole studio and gear. And so she lived a couple hours away. Um, and she was like, I'd love to like come out and check out your studio and stuff. And so that's kind of <laughs> how we met. And then we, wow. we sort of like worked on projects together, um, for a few months until finally we were like, I, I mean, <laughs> I think that like maybe, uh, there's a project between us we should work on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then, yeah. And then we, we got married in 2020 during the pandemic. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations, man. Thanks. That's amazing. Two yeah. years now, I guess. Almost. Two years. Yeah, we got married at the local movie theater because everything was mm -hmm. closed and yeah. our county office took over the movie theater. So we just had to go to the ticket counter. <laughs> and like, oh, my goodness. That's they were cool, behind though. the glass. It's really cool. They didn't allow anyone there. So we actually had to stream our wedding on YouTube, uh, which is cool. <laughs> oh, perfect. Like we met on That's YouTube. Perfect. I did my first Full live circle. stream the day we met and then we got married on YouTube. Like, wow, that's amazing. So yeah. I guess childbirth live stream coming soon. <laughs> I that would that, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's fascinating. I yeah. I would have to say you're the only person I've ever met that met their spouse on YouTube in that way. So you guys should have your own plaque, like a specific yeah, right? they should give a <laughs> YouTube plaque. This is a good story. Like. like honestly, I feel like YouTube like as a headquarters would want to know this story. I think it's actually kind of amazing. I mean, YouTube's so special to us. I know like it's easy to get frustrated by and complain about and stressed out by, but there's always that part where it's like, wow, if without it, our lives wouldn't be anything that they are. So I can kind of never get mad at it. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So man, what a wild ride I guess you've had over the last four years of yeah. kind of taking this seriously. Um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people may consider you an expert at is the podcast audio kind of thing. Can you, obviously we, we got the video cameras and all that too, mm -hmm. but when I filter by most popular, it's a lot of podcast related yeah. stuff. And that's how I discovered your content. Can you talk to me about just, you know, that whole side of your interests and uh, yeah. what kind of got you into it and uh, what you love about kind of the audio space yeah i would definitely i would hesitate to call myself an expert but i'm i'm always trying to learn more and so i know that you know every video every time i put out a video that's like here's an audio thing or a microphone i know i'm making mistakes and i know there's ways it should sound better but i'm trying to level up as much as i can too um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's so teaching like digital media production 
it, I, I had no problem teaching kids about cameras and they could start shooting good looking video. Like that was actually kind of easy, but their audio was always terrible. And mm. it, really quickly I learned we need to focus more on audio than anything. Like I don't really care if they're shooting with a phone or whatever, but it needs to sound decent. Um, and that was, I just sort of realized like that was a weak point for a lot of people, myself, my students, and then people out there. And it's so easy now to get good audio. Like you can get a road mic. You can, you could get something super expensive and crazy, but you can also just get like something for your phone or a really simple device. that's going to level up yeah. your audio to a crazy degree. And I started making those videos and I guess there's just a lot of people who know that because a lot of people, they start making videos or doing streams or podcasts and they realize my sound sucks. <laughs> what do I do? And they're looking for simple yeah. solutions. And I think the thing I'm trying to focus on, or I, I hope what comes across is it's not so much like here's full on film industry like that. That's not really where I come from that's not really where I think my audience is but it's like I'm one guy who wants to make stuff that looks and sounds as good as I can as one guy so here's some ways to do that here's some tools and tips and feels like there's a lot of people that connect with that and um, I just try yeah. to kind of think of things I've struggled with in the past and then make videos about that or questions I have and make videos about that that I think are helpful and uh, it seems like it's been helpful to people for for the past few years which is yeah great. seriously yeah. Well, I'm looking at, again, I, I like to do this with the guests. I'll like <laughs> go to your channel and just filter by most popular and, um, your top six are all from the last year. Yeah. Um, and they're all, uh, multi-camera podcast, live stream and zoom calls. Mm -hmm. How good is the biggest USB mic? How to convert VHS tapes into digital. That's interesting <laughs> that that popped off. Yeah. Make that, your, yeah. Tell me about that. That one still goes crazy. Um, and it's, it's a cool video, but like it brings in a very interesting crowd. Cause there's like, there's people who like are like, my, <laughs> my dad would find that probably, you know, while he's trying to convert old tapes to digital. Yeah, so I it's, mean, it's super helpful, but there's this crowd of people who are like, they refuse to accept that VHS is a format of the past. And I know there's a nostalgia <laughs> factor, like you've got the CRT okay. TV behind you, okay. but there's people who are yeah. like, no, it's actually the superior medium. And it is not. We can all, I feel like, <laughs> objectively agree that this is not superior to anything. It's right. nostalgic, for yes. sure. But. Yeah, and I love that, but it's like, no, they will melt if you leave them in the garage over the summer. Like, they do degrade <laughs> just sitting around. And I, I have got people writing essays on that video about, it's very strange. Um, and the thing, the other thing about that video is the intro to it. <laughs> A couple years ago, Peter McKinnon did the, um, I can't think of the director's challenge, but it's the the director that does the really quick like I think they're like hot fuzz. Oh yeah, I'm watching it right now. Um, it is Edgar Wright. Yeah, where it's like doo, 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 like quick things, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I'm gonna do a little montage, like an Edgar Wright style montage. And so that's what that. that video starts with, <laughs> which is so embarrassing <laughs> that like it's a popular video, and it introduces well, people to my channel. And the first thirty seconds, don't you think that may be why? I mean, it's so hooky. Maybe, it's it's a maybe great it intro. is. Maybe it is, but I get like every time it pops up as a comment, someone leaves. I'm like, oh, no, they saw the thing and the like, <laughs> but maybe that is maybe that is what maybe I need to do more of that. Every video. Should do that. <laughs> yeah, every video needs an Edgar Wright intro. <laughs> um, yeah, you're just using the Elgato uh, capture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the component to USB um, yeah. thing. And that's great. Um there are people like there, there actually is archival tape that you can buy that is still sold um, yeah. because technically there is a certain type of tape that is better for archiving purposes than hard drives, but right. not VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then finding stuff to play that on because a lot of people are also like, well, a CD will last longer than a hard drive. And I'm like, yeah, it will. But I don't know what I'm going to be able to play that on in 20 years is the problem. Like, I already don't have anything that takes CDs. So. I'm interrupting this podcast briefly to tell you about a brand new product from Polar Pro that we just released called the Pivot Shoulder Rig. Now for listeners of the Golden Hour podcast, if you use the code GH25, you can save $25 off of this new shoulder rig. Pivot is an ultra compact shoulder rig specifically designed for run and gun shooting. It aims to give a versatile experience and provides a multitude of shooting positions for different scenarios. There's a quick release plate system built in 
an adjustable shoulder pad, tool-free height adjustments, different rod extenders that are your natural rod size for mat boxes and follow focus, and seven grip angle adjustments on the handles. And when you're ready to go home, the shoulder rig actually collapses down and it weighs under four pounds, has compact storage, and can totally fit in most camera bags. The thing that I love about this shoulder rig is that you can really configure it in different ways. You can use it like a traditional shoulder rig. You can use it pressed up against your chest in a very kind of run and gun scenario. And it doesn't require any heavy counterweights to use it. This is the first time that Polar Pro has entered this market and they've thought this out very heavily for travel filmmakers and Honestly, I could see this being used a lot in a YouTube scenario as well. A lot of the cameras these days have IBIS built in or in-body image stabilization, but there's nothing that beats that natural fluidity that happens with a proper shoulder rig. So if you wanna save $25 off of the Pivot shoulder rig, then make sure to go to polarpro.com and in the coupon code section, type out GH25 and you can save $25 off of the new pivot shoulder rig. All right, without any further ado, let's get back to my interview. I think the point I was trying to make is that it looks like a lot of these kind of popped off during the pandemic yeah. um, because people were probably trying to up their Zoom calls and like st get started yes. doing podcasting. Yeah. Tell it, me your side of that, like the back end of what you saw over the last two years. That, I mean, that's exactly what it was because I, I was teaching uh, when the pandemic hit and I, you know, suddenly had to start teaching on zoom and then i ended up teaching on zoom for a year and i i'm so glad that i was equipped to do that because i saw the struggle that it was for so many other like teachers that i worked with but you know i had this setup for my classes and multiple yeah. cameras and i could put graphics with ecam and do all this <laughs> Dude, stuff so you were the <laughs> coolest teacher ever i guarantee it <laughs> it was fun like, like we would do the really kids fun probably stuff. loved that you had multiple cameras and like yeah. you're doing this whole thing like it's actually engaging for the students to have a teacher that knows what they're doing with the cameras yeah oh wait everyone else was on chromebooks with just the built-in chromebook webcam and it's <sighs> like and the students have eight classes so seven of their classes were that and i was like i feel like if i can switch angles and we can have decent audio that that's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. It was cool because the students would like, you know, I would notice over the course of a semester or something like, oh, you got a USB mic now and you have a little boom arm and like I would see their setups oh, kind of cool. evolve. And that was cool. And that's what a lot of people were doing was uh, they needed good Zoom calls. A lot of people, once they started getting good audio and video for work, they were like, this is kind of fun. Maybe I should start a podcast. Maybe I should do a YouTube channel. And that's where I think they started searching for stuff. And that's where I think my channel started being helpful because it a lot of stuff really did pop at that point in time. Um, and it was cool. Like, I feel like a lot of people discovered that they could do something they never thought of before. Even people in totally mm -hmm. different professions like medicine or legal or something were like, oh, I could totally do some digital media thing. Totally. Um, and like, what am I trying to say? Uh, I don't remember. I lost my train of thought because <laughs> I was too distracted looking at my, I'm looking at my computer, which is off to my right, but then my camera is like, no, I, here. are you doing that too? Yeah. I got my screen here, camera here. <laughs> and I'm trying, I'm like, I, yeah, yeah. you're, you're as close to the lens as possible, but yeah. <laughs> trying oh, to I, be I, re I remember now. I remember what I was going to ask what is the why behind Tom Buck, like the channel? What is the, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Is there like kind of a Good thesis question. to what you're doing? And I mean, I kind of get a little taste of it when you tell me about how you've, you've been able to see people take what you've ta taught them and like advance their stuff. I mean, is that really the kind of why for you? Um, yeah, I don't know that I've, this, I'm glad you asked that because I don't know that I've really fleshed that out. I think I know it, but I don't know that I've like, Ugh, like condensed it into a statement but i that's what it is is i love this stuff and i've always loved this stuff but not only am i excited about it i feel like that by sharing my excitement for it other people catch that and then when other people do it they it's like become empowered to to do their own thing and to me that's so exciting like i i love it when people leave a nice comment on youtube you know that's nice but my favorite ones are when someone will say like thank you for this. It taught me how to do blah, 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 or your channel really helped me to figure something out. And it's like, that's cool that someone watched one of my videos, learned something, and now they're using that. I guess that's, you know, I, I like teaching. Teaching's really cool. And through YouTube, you can teach not just like a group of people who 
are forced to be in the room with you, but you can <laughs> teach a global audience of people that that choose to be there and are interested in specifically how you're doing things. And, you know, if they don't like the way I do it, there's a ton of other people that they can go to. And it's it's really cool to just, I don't know, share something you're excited about and see that help somebody else learn to be excited about it, too. Man, I love your perspective. It's such an innocent teacher's perspective. It's like <laughs> they can choose to watch my videos or someone else's. Right. They don't they're not forced to listen to me. It's like <laughs> Yeah. Uh that's the beauty of it and the, I love that perspective cuz that is you're like being a teacher, you are teaching me to have that perspective cuz I never even thought about it that way. That yeah. it is a kind of a blessing that people have the choice to decide. Oh, well, this guy is I mean, I guess I was kind of like making fun of myself at the beginning of the show yeah. being a little goofy, but maybe that's why you were kind of encouraging me because it's like technically I should just be myself and just the people who like that will subscribe and the people who don't, they can go somewhere else. Exactly. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like there's somebody else who will <laughs> suit. There's so many people. There's someone else who will suit those needs because like what I noticed when I was teaching was like, you know, English teachers, for example. So every high school is going to have I don't know, four 10th grade English teachers. And they're all mm -hmm. teaching the same thing. It's the same curriculum, same books, but every student is going to have a different favorite English teacher. Like, yeah, it's the same stuff, but it's just how the person is delivering it, how the personalities connect. That's what you, it's like less about the material and more about that. And, you know, you can make your video about the C70 that's like crazy quick and fast and like punchy. <laughs> And some people are going to love it and some people aren't. And the people who don't, mm -hmm. they could go find someone who makes a 90 minute video <laughs> that's a bit slower and, you know, maybe yeah, a little yeah. drier, but that's cool because that's what's going to work for them. And that's okay. kind of the beauty of YouTube is it doesn't have to be so competitive. It's not like that right, person's yeah. going to watch one video today. It's like, yeah, you know, there's plenty of plenty of pieces of the pie for everybody, hopefully. I appreciate you saying that. I think my problem is I don't see anybody doing what I'm doing. So I feel like I'm yeah. uh, uh, like doing it wrong. <laughs> so yeah. but I guess it's just the way that I like to do it. So that's okay. You know? well, it seems like the, the C70 video, because that was like your first, not first video, obviously, but like your first one in a while where it's like, hey, I want to come back and, and yeah. kind of try a different voice a little bit. And um, seems like it got a good reception from what I saw. Yeah, it's it performed well. It was one out of ten, so that's, that's not bad. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> the last video, the last video Zach posted was back in November, so it's kind of been dead for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm I'm very excited, and I I took everything I learned from Indie Mogul and yeah. am applying that. I'm basically just picking up where I left off. There is the idea. It's I'm not picking up where I left off with Kino. Mm -hmm. I'm picking up where I left off with Indie Mogul. In yeah, theory. I bet that was like a really cool learning time oh my gosh yeah it was it really was and uh i didn't realize how like blessed <laughs> i was in that situation either because i was just so in the moment and like mm -hmm. the stress of having to you know do two a week and you know having people that are paying you money to do it and a big company and all this and that mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um i was just so in it and i think i needed this last year to kind of get out of it to kind of re rejigger myself and like yeah. refocus on my wife and my marriage and stuff. So, uh, which has been really good. I talk yeah, about this too much on the podcast. People are sick of hearing it. I'm sure but. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder. It's a reminder to, that we, yeah, a career is not everything. And mm -hmm. you got to just remember, like, even if you're a single person, like have relationships outside of work and like try to focus on yourself in terms of, you know, spiritual, physical, yeah. uh, mental, like all those things, it's a, there's a spoke of life and every spoke has to have balance to like be healthy. Yeah, um, totally. And it's and weird in America. Take, <laughs> we're not taught just, that. <laughs> yeah, we're not taught that. Exactly. No. Yeah. Sorry. I keep cutting you off. No, I was just going to say when you, um, when you take a break, sometimes it feels like you shouldn't, like I should be working hard, I should be putting more time, but like going mm -hmm. away for a while and coming back to something, sometimes you find that like you're better when you come back. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, like I, you know, I have instruments that I, I play know. for fun and it's like I'll practice the drums every day and I'll be like if I play the drums every every single day for three months I'm gonna be so good and it's like not really actually if I take a break for four or five days <laughs> or a week sometimes come back it's like I can do things that I couldn't do before like my brain like 
finalized some things or I don't know, reordered some yeah. stuff. And now it's 100%. like, wow, I'm better and I'm more excited and it, it feels less like work and it's more fun. So even when you like something, I think it is important to step back, take a break, do something else and totally. then jump back into it. You have more appreciation for it. And honestly, this year I was sort of like I committed to a year of working with my cousins and they're, they were teachers as well. And they built a very successful business selling courses to wedding photographers. Mm. And so I did all of their, uh, their video for the last year oh, doing different courses cool. and stuff. And that's the reason I have the C70. Um, they purchased it for me to use. And then um, we came to an agreement actually recently that I would acquire it and like basically pay it off over the next year. So that's cool, which is awesome. A huge blessing to be able to have access to an amazing camera. So <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> but um, what was I saying? uh, that, that commitment that I made kind of forced me to, um, I was going to try to do YouTube on the side, but I just, I couldn't, I was working eight hours a day and it was yeah. just with my kids and stuff. I was just like, the podcast is all I could do last year. Yeah, um, but what lot. it allowed me to do is I just listened to a ton of podcasts. <laughs> I just studied a lot and like, I'm ready to go. Cause I've been, you know, reading reading this book. I'm sure you've got oh, it yeah. or read it. The YouTube <laughs> yeah, yeah. formula. This came out last year, I think. Uh, I think it was last year when it came out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just if you're a YouTuber at all, buy the YouTube formula book by Daryl Eves. It's like a must buy. It's like the Bible for there's, YouTube. What's cool about it is there's like practical takeaways. So it's, there's like lots of philosophical stuff and case studies, but there's also like, here's how to like, compose a thumbnail that has two people in it here's how to compose a thumbnail that has one and it's like yeah oh wow this is just simple you know you could it just really apply is. that right now and it's like it'll tell you like go to your analytics click this look at this find that and you're like oh okay it's it's not yeah. just all theory it's very practical he may have to do like a revised version in like five years when <laughs> yeah. youtube studio changes everything again but <laughs> yeah for now it's for now it's up to date um so I want to change gears and mm -hmm. talk about gear for a second. Okay. Um, the SM7B, we are both using it right now. Yes. From Sure. Um, I don't know if you know the whole history of it, but if you do, I'd like for you to share it. But yeah, why well, do you I'm choose using, that mic? I chose this one because that's what you'd be using. <laughs> I want <this> to match. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah. So uh, the Is SM7B. Is it not your daily driver anymore? It's my walls are covered in microphones that like okay. are like... I, I'm doing I'm in the middle of a 10 episode run of my own podcast and literally every week I'm doing a different mic <laughs> just to oh wow <laughs> just because they're so different um, what's your but podcast the SM, it's the enthusiasm project I have several but that's the the main one that I do then my wife yes. and I do one okay. and then Peter Lindgren and I sometimes do one when time oh, zones Peter. allow it <laughs> can you yeah. connect me to him I've never met him oh yeah he's such a good just nice guy um yeah for sure Seems like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the uh, SM7B is just such a good, like, I need a mic that's going to sound good on any voice in any environment. It's the SM7B. And um, I mean, I want to look like Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, it, it's, it took me a while. I was actually not a fan of the SM7B for a long time. And I kind of thought that like a lot of people were spending $400 on a mic that maybe they didn't need just because they saw Joe Rogan using it or saw lots yeah. of other people using it. And, you know, you kind of need you need more than the mic to make it sound good. You pro you might need a booster. You need a good mixer and interface. And it's hard to recommend all that to someone when it's like well, there's other cheaper options or you get a condenser or whatever. But <laughs> once I. Because I, I I got I I know the SM70 has been around since the 70s in one form or another, and obviously yeah. it's been used on iconic. It's a mic. Yeah, Michael Jackson. I think Thriller is uh, recorded yeah. on it, and Rolling Stones, and like yeah, yeah it's, it's just been around. It's forever. one of those things where it's like no matter who you are, you have heard the SM7B many times, probably today. Um, not including this podcast, but like outside of this. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> you've definitely alone. heard the SM7B. Um, yeah, yeah. But when so I was, am I wrong in using it or <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're perfect. Um, I was wrong is the thing because I was setting up uh, maybe like eight years ago. I was setting up a podcast studio at, in my like classroom studio 
and I got a grant and I was like, I'm going to buy pro level stuff. I'm going to get that shore microphone that everybody uses, all the radio stations use. And I got four of them. And I was so excited because we were just using like video shotgun mics prior to that, just like pieced <laughs> oh, wow. together whatever we had. Um, yeah. And I plugged in the shores and they did not, or yeah, the shores and they didn't sound good. I was like, oh, and I just wasn't, I was kind of bummed. And it took oh, me a long time to learn like, oh, I was using it wrong. Like I was not using a mixer that had enough gain. I was not in the right environment for this microphone. Like the, oh, okay. it wasn't the mic, it was user error. My skills grew over time. And finally, by the time I got my own SM7B, because anytime I talk about a microphone on my channel or a mixer or whatever, people want to know how it compares or sounds with the SM7B. So I kind of was like, I have to have one because mm -hmm. that's what I need. And I remember literally the day I got it and I plugged it into my setup, which was proper, like capable of using it. I literally did laugh out loud because it sounded so good. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh my God. Like I wanted it to sound bad so I could be like, no, you yeah. only need, you know, this hundred dollar microphone. I was like, no, nope, I get it. Get the SM7B. It's good. <laughs> um, plus the, I think I didn't realize it's like the, the noise rejection and the shock amount in it. It has no handling noise. Like it rejects everything. So when you move your boom arm or you accidentally bump it, I don't so know many other microphones. Mine it. Listen, I'm getting it. I mean, bit. but so many other mics, it's like, it sounds like Jurassic Park was when you, when yeah. you, like, when you do, so, so I don't know. It's That's a why good it's like, mic. Cause, cause they're like floating on the little rubber bands or whatever. And yeah. Like, yeah. And you know, it's, you just kind of realize like, yeah, I guess this has been a popular mic for like 40 years or at least a version for of a it. Reason. Yeah, yeah. For a reason. And you, you know, I had to rediscover that on my own, but mics are fun. So I love okay. switching between them. Um, so yeah, walk like, me through. Walk yeah. me through a couple of your favorites then. Yeah, um, here's one. Um, outside of the SM7B. Uh, yeah, he's reaching into his toolbox, which is behind him. Reaching into my drawer, because um, this one's not on the wall. This is the Earthworks Icon. Ooh. Uh, I was going to use this one today. I was really debating, because I love this this one here. It's um, it's a condenser mic, but it sounds so good. $500. Okay, yeah, 500 bucks. Yeah. Um, it's got this crazy looking capsule on it because Earthworks makes all these like high end microphones and like mm. instrument mics and audio measuring devices and things. And this thing, oh, it sounds magical. I love this one a lot. I love the Rode NT1. Um, really? I mean, it's, I like condenser mics because it's so easy to um, give enough gain to them. You don't need a booster or anything. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but you need a better treated room because they're going to pick up so much sound of your environment compared to okay. like the SM7B is going to reject a lot more reverb and yeah. room tone and stuff. But if you're in a decently treated place, a condenser mic can sometimes be sometimes be cheaper <laughs> and uh, you don't need a booster because it's going to have plenty of gains so, like mm. the Lewitt LCT 240 back there. That's a really good sounding microphone. It's like 160 bucks. Um, I think the oh, capsule wow. in that is the same one that they put in the Elgato Wave usb mic so okay super similar sound quality between those ones uh, and then i love i have a couple on the wall back here like the shore super 55 the old like elvis mic that's just oh yeah yeah it's really really fun um it's crazy just like i don't know how microphones have such different personalities and what you can do with different ones and the histories behind them i got the re20 on the wall over here which is like you know the sm7b and the re20 kind of have this long-standing i don't know like a rivalry but history like interlinked history and it's i don't know i i don't know why i, I have this weird memory oh yeah the the re not not re is in like re alexa it's the <laughs> no, yeah, electronic yeah. voice the electric R voice R R R R e 20 yeah 20 dynamic yeah i've seen this one a lot like i think um twit um uses this the uh yeah like um, uh, Mac Mac Break Weekly, Leo Laporte uses that, I think. Yeah, Marquez Brown. I, no, Marquez doesn't use the RE20. He uses like the 320. But basically, it used to come in this weird chrome tan color, mm -hmm. like from the 60s onward. And then they released a black version. And that's when everyone was like, now I'm using the RE20 because it looks cool. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, so it's a good move on their part to do a black version. Yeah, totally. It does. 
here's my problem, and it's obviously very immature. Anything that has any type of phallic uh, aesthetic, <laughs> I'm not a fan of. So. I'm glad you said it and not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is, fortunately, there's a really cool giant shock mount that it goes in that really like covers things up and in in a, makes it look like a... In the RE20? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a giant shock mount that's like huge, but it, it really makes the thing look mm -hmm. uh, different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's usually like when people ask me, so why do you use the SM7B? And I'm like, because it doesn't look like a c***. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to cut that out. But um, <laughs> You're not wrong. But hey, that's where like the Shure Super 55 is a super stylish mic that uh, doesn't look like anything else. Super 55. Okay. Yeah, I would grab my mic. I'll bleep that out. People will find that funny. Oh, yeah, that's the Elvis one. That's the yeah. Elvis one. That's a cool mic. It sounds good. It's very hard to mount because it's it's mounts are in like yeah. an inconvenient position. But that's the let's put this on a mic stand and give it to the talent for the music video mic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Miley Cyrus all over that thing. Um, yeah. I noticed I think it's Conan's podcast. They started using those recently. Um, does it sound good? a lot more? It does for sound podcast? good. I love the super this there's the regular 55 and the super 55. I love the super They're not 55. too expensive. No, and the super 55 is blue also. It's yeah, kind of prone to plosives, um so you got to like position uh -huh. it, but um otherwise it sounds real good. Well, here's something I'd like to ask you actually as a, as fellow SM7B users. <laughs> yeah. Here. I use the giant ball usually. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, there's two foam windscreens that come with the SM7B. Mm -hmm. This one that we're using, which is kind of the standard one. And then the one that's bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the one that's bigger helps with the p -p -p -p, you know, yeah. plosives. Um, I still, I'm, I've noticed in this podcast, I've, I've hit it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, but almost every comedy podcaster uses the SM7B and they don't use, they use this, this yeah. one. Joe Rogan uses it. I mean, you are using it. What What is the correct... I think it sounds a little crisper with this one. It's a little too bassy yeah. with the other one. Yeah. Um, I actually have experimented with taking this completely off and just having a, a windscreen uh, pop yeah, I filter. I saw that. Which was kind of fun. Um, it sounded really crystal clear, which was nice. Um, but what is the correct way to actually use this in terms of like distance from my mouth... Should it right. be like a little below it so that my plosives don't hit it? Like what what are I'll, the uh, what's the way to do it? There's the correct way and then there's what I do. I'll tell you what I do. Um, okay. Since I don't want to claim to be like the correct one. But uh, what I did notice once I learned more about the SM7B, I did equip like several uh, like school studios with them. So it, it's a lot of SM7Bs over the years. And what I would do is I would always use the big windscreen when it would be a situation where people who weren't used to talking on a mic would be using the mic because mm -hmm. they might get really close to it or breathe really heavily on it. And that big fat windscreen is going to just cut all of that out uh, and they could be sometimes too close to it and it would be OK. Uh, so that that would be my like you're not familiar with microphones. It's like the when you go to the bowling alley and they put the bumpers in the gutter, it's like, this is <laughs> yeah. your bumper. You can't oh, mess it up. Every podcast I've had that on. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what I like. Cause I, I do like, I know you're not supposed to care what a microphone looks like, but I like the visual appeal of the slimmer one. It's I just, agree. The SM7 I've always is, agreed with that. It's got yeah. a cool cylindrical thing. I have, this is the most popular question on my channel now. I guess I won't touch it cause we're recording, but um, I found reporterstore.com. I'm not associated with them. It's not an ad. Uh, they're based in Europe, but you can get colored windscreens for the SM7B and they have like every color. That's awesome. So I have a bright blue one, of course. Um, and they even have them for like shotgun mics and other oh mics. Oh my too. gosh. They have a new one that just came out. It is a metallic gold flocked. I with, have that uh, one. <laughs> oh, you do? They send that it. They, I think because I've ordered so much from them and referred so many people, even though I'm not connected, I think they kind of like know when oh, I yeah. place an order because they gave me that one. They were like, here's a free gift. Like, check it out. I was like, that's awesome. It's dude. gold and glittery. Uh, it's cool. It's not quite my style, but it's cool. Um, <laughs> but it's fun because everyone has the SM7B so you can like tie it in with a brand color or your personality totally. or whatever. Um, but it, yeah. it doesn't really sound that different than the one that comes with it. And these do fit on the Shure MV7 and MV7X, um, which... Is that the new one that is like a USB one of the SM7B? Yeah. 
but not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not the exact same form factor, but the uh, pop filters fit on it and it's way better than the ones that come with the mic. So it's a, it's a cool upgrade. Um, but I like this one and I always position it. I think the SM7B does sound good when you're closer to it because it's not picking up as much of the room. So what am I? I'm like a fist's distance, a fistance away from the, distance. Oh, the microphone nice. right now. Um, Dude, I love that. That was a good. That's one. usually about how far I am. And uh, I usually do position it either under or off to the side. So I'm not speaking into it, but speaking over it. So that way, even though it does reject plosives pretty well, it, I have to really kind of try or mess up to make it hit a plosive. And that's so it's it's a, f- a fistive away from my mouth and it's below it's below my yeah, mouth. We have ours. So I'm the same pretty much. Yeah. So I'm I'm cor- I'm in a correct position now. Yeah. I just said position and it didn't. Yeah, it did p- position. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have to boost it a little bit more than I had it at because I'm used. I am. I have. I've just become used to having it. Yeah. Right up on there with the with the bigger windscreen. But it, it I mean, it does. You know, that that's definitely part of the SM7B is you get the sound by being close to the mic for sure. For yeah. Sure. And then and then let's kind of settle the debate here. <laughs> Cloud lifter. Uh, oh. the dynamite thing mm. um what yeah. what is the right thing to do here i've got the cloud lifter with the sm7b but people have ripped me to shreds for having it for some there, reason okay yeah people people rip your shreds for everything you can't go wrong let's just put it that way i have like basically all of them you can't go wrong um the clark technic ct1 is one that i've been recommending because it's only usually like 35 dollars, maybe 40 um mm. and it works by the way great. we do need to preface what we're talking about right right this mic this microphone requires some sort of, i mean it doesn't really require it but it's such a low can you explain this actually yeah a lot of times it's it's a gain hungry microphone so a lot of times when you get it and you plug it into your mixer interface especially if you got something like a scarlet 2i2 and you get your sm7b and you plug it in you're going to notice you have to crank the gain up all the way on your interface and it's still not sounding good or it's sounding hissy because the gain is so high and you're like i don't sound like everyone else i hear and so you can buy a booster for your for your microphone that adds clean gain to the signal so it uh, most of them will add somewhere like 25 to 30 decibels of clean gain with no hiss so that way you can boost the signal get better sound have more headroom if you're someone who talks super loud you might not need it or if you have you know certain mixers and interfaces don't need yeah, it. Yeah, like but. the the um uh, people still use it, but the uh the mix pre three is pretty mm-hmm. good. You don't yeah. necessarily need it for that. Um, yeah, some of the fancy sound mixers. Yeah, um, so I usually recommend people get the mic and then see if they need something, but just kind of get it expecting that like it might not be loud enough, and if not, then you can get a booster. Um, the yeah. Clark Technic that I mentioned is an easy one to recommend because it's affordable. Um, yeah. B- but my it's personal favorite. Clark with a K, by the way. Clark with a K and Technic with two Ks, I think. Yeah, T-E-K-N-I-K. I'm looking yeah. at it on Amazon. Uh, they are sold out on Amazon, but. Yeah, um, usually I've had good luck with Sweetwater, but sometimes I have a couple of them because I just sort of order them when they're available. But I've had to wait a couple months to get them because they're popular and cheap. Um, yeah. So the other one, the cloud lifter is great and the cloud lifter looks cool. It also, it's just this cool <laughs> retro metal box and yeah, it's sturdy. I, like I, I, I'll probably be able to have this for the rest of my life. It probably oh, won't. Yeah. It, 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 that's what you want with audio gear too. That's what I love about audio gear. Mm-hmm. It's so analog and so like tactile. Yeah. Me and too. this is one of them that like, it's just a solid box. I've dropped it multiple <laughs> times and yeah. it's and totally it's fine. You know, and it's blue. Hey, I like it. Um, I one hundred and fifty dollars. It's pricey, but they also do make. I have the two channel version, so I have uh, one of which those is more well. expensive. But mm-hmm. you can then just run two mics through, and it's one unit. And that's cool. Um, totally. The one I'm using right now is the Fet Head, which I think is my favorite. That's just personal preference, though. Um, so what's the difference between all these? Because they the all do SC the same Dynamite thing. one, the <laughs> Fet Head preamp. They all okay. do the same thing. The biggest difference is some of them try, like the Fet Head and the Cloud Lifter, r- I think, really try to not affect the tone of the microphone at all. Um, and 
other ones like the there's one called the Soyuz. I think okay. that's what it is. Um, but it's specifically designed to add sort of like a tone and a character to the mic. So like your mic will sound different and that's what it's supposed to oh, do. Weird. So that that's a difference. Um, and also where they're made, like if some people care about this, some people don't, but like the Clark Technics made in China, the Fethead is made in Holland. Holland. The it's Cloud Lifter is made in the USA. So, you know, sometimes you might want to just choose where it's manufactured. The reason I like the Fethead is because you do have the option. It's it's pretty small and you can mm -hmm. plug it directly into the microphone, kind of like the Dynamite, I think, does the same thing. And the Coda Stealth does it, too. You can plug it straight into the mic or even straight into your mixer or you can run like a little extension cable to it. So it's just yeah. been the most versatile one for me when you're trying, you know, sometimes that you have a mic hooked up and things don't fit places. Yeah. Um, the Fet head has been the one that I, I like. I know it's going to work kind of no matter what my setup is. I think you're so, yeah, so yeah. you heard it here. So Tom's recommendation, Tret head audio, Fet head filter in like inline microphone. It's ninety five dollars. Made That's in my Holland. favorite one. Yeah. But it's just personal preference. I'm just going to say that personal preference. But so why, why do people in the comments always tell me that the uh, cloud lifter is terrible? I, <laughs> I have no idea, honestly. Um, cause, because maybe because it's overpriced compared to these other options, I guess, or maybe, but it's like it's a really well built thing that's made in the USA. So, like, is it overpriced? I don't know. No, uh, I, I'm happy. I'm, I couldn't. I like the build of it. I like it's got the little rubber feet on it. Yeah. Like it's it's a solid piece you of run uh, over it probably yeah. and it will still work. <laughs> totally. um, it's like it's it's be, they gave you that problem because you went online and you said you liked something and so people have to tell you it <laughs> yeah. sucks. Totally. Yeah. I made I made a video about how much I like the new GoPro, the Hero 10. Um, and the mm -hmm. video is doing really well, but oh my god. <laughs> people <laughs> hate that I like the GoPro. I'm like cuz I said it's it's basically perfect. And what I meant was it's basically perfect for, for a GoPro. GoPro. And people exactly. are like upset that it's not a C70 or some kind of cinema <laughs> camera. Like, yeah, it's 400 bucks. Like, I don't know what you expect. But <laughs> for a GoPro, it's pretty friggin' great. And it does everything I need it to do. <laughs> I don't know what else for a GoPro. from it. Yeah, yeah, for a GoPro. Well, that's um, the thing is, yeah, GoPro 10. Um, the last two or three have been kind of the ultimate GoPro where yeah. it's like we finally arrived where you don't need the case anymore. It's like waterproof no matter what. It's got the built-in little teeth so you don't mm -hmm. have to have a case for the teeth separate, you know. It's yeah. got that screen so you can look at yourself while front. you're filming. and Crazy um, stabilization. Stabilization is magical. It's like crazy, yeah. crazy. Um Audio still sucks. Battery still sucks. <laughs> so yeah. It's like, I mean, the audio on the 10 is not bad. Um, it's way okay. more usable than I found on the other ones. That's uh, good to know. Yeah. And I mean, battery, I don't know. About I just, battery life. I feel like it's the same, honestly. it's. I like the 10 because it has a faster processor than the other one. So like the 8 and the 9 that had some of the same features, they were kind of laggy because they were using old chips inside and the 10 they mm -hmm. updated the processor so it's a lot faster and easier to use without like not responsive menus and things so that's why i really like that yeah um and i do think the sound is better and the battery life is kind of the same i just i don't know i've always known if you have a gopro take a few extra batteries with you and that's yeah just what you do with a gopro it just stinks that like yeah like i my my iphone can run all day right, right. like but the GoPro <laughs> oh my god i have a kindle minutes. that i have to charge every two months like it's the <laughs> exactly. best <laughs> <laughs> exactly the, the paper the uh, e-paper yeah. display um so yeah while we're on the topic of things you like let's talk about cameras and kind of Ooh. what you're currently shooting <laughs> on and um you know, you were kind of a Canon guy. In I fact, the video Canon. that I saw was um, like all the setups that you built for schools. It looked like you had like 40 EOS R's that you bought. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> we, we had everything from Rebels to uh, 70 D's, 80 D's, tons of EOS R's because they're really good cameras. We have C200, C100s, um, basically like everything Canon offers. That's I never bought like a. I guess it didn't happen when I started teaching, but like the R5 was just coming out around the time I was leaving. And I was like, eh, I don't want to invest that much in one camera that, you know, a kid could take and drop or something. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so you got to be like a little bit practical, but you got to be aware of stuff like, well, when I started teaching digital media in 2012, 4K wasn't a thing. 
So a manual focus, you know, 60D or a 5D Mark II was perfect. But in mm -hmm. 2020, it made more sense to do something that had some kind of 4K or good autofocus or something. And um, and Canon lenses are just so good. They're so stable. And the thing about Canon is even the Rebels, I, I had a few students, maybe two or three over the years, lose a camera and have to like pay for it. Oh my uh, I did have one drop it in the ocean, but the camera ended up working again That's and that was hilarious. it i never had a camera fail a canon camera even the rebels being used by ninth graders for years they never <laughs> like they 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 would get scratched and beat up but they never failed and that to me was like dang wow uh, <laughs> that says a lot for the reliability of these things so it's so funny that uh, that really like pulled me into canon a lot and i i had used canon for years too um and you know they're good cameras it was just when it comes to video and if you don't want to jump into the cinema series and you're looking at the mirrorless cameras, they have great options that are super capable, all my opinion, of course, uh, mm -hmm. but they're they're not video centric. Like video is the secondary feature to photo. And it's like yeah, I've done I've ranted about this for hours, but <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> I always wish Canon would really serve their video customers more. And they just the don't in cameras. The, yeah, well, even stuff like the R3 having a micro HDMI port. Like, what? That camera is the, the R, side? The R, no, the R5C having a micro HDMI The, R, the, the cinema camera having that a, that one killed HDMI me. Port. I was like, yeah, and you're putting a you're putting a fan on it. Can you just at least put a full size HDMI on it? Yeah, and I, I saw an interview uh, with a guy from Canon about that where he was asked, like, why does it have micro HDMI? And the guy was like, well, you know, um, we totally understand why people would want full-size HDMI. And if, you know, if we could go back and redo it, we totally would do that. And my thought was, you're the company that makes it. Who else could go back and redo it? Like, you you did it. You, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. you should be the ones to go back and redo it. And I know that's a small thing, but when you then look at like Sony, where basically every of their full frame cameras, especially their video centric or hybrid ones, full size HDMI, amazing autofocus, no record limits. And it's like, wow, uh, I didn't realize I had these constraints until I looked at mm -hmm. places they weren't offered. And about a year ago, I, I, I loved my EOS R. I still think it's a really good value, especially if you don't need a total 4K workflow. Um, mm -hmm for $1,600 or whatever it is, it's such a rock solid camera and it's a good hybrid camera, but I really wanted to do like native 4K, full frame 4K and Canon just didn't, like I pre-ordered the R5 then canceled it and then was gonna get the R6 and then didn't, cause I also do live in the desert. Like it, it gets 120 degrees in the summer. <laughs> Overheating is a concern. <laughs> that, yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very real concern and so I was like, okay, I want to use a Canon camera, but maybe, maybe there are other options for me for what I need. And so I tried really hard of just stepping back and like looking at everything that was out there. And like I rented a Pocket 6K Pro. I was like looking at Panasonic. Um, and there's so many amazing cameras. Like every camera is great. Um, but the things that I needed where it was like, mm -hmm. of course, good image quality, but really good autofocus was important to me. Full size HDMI was important to me. Um, reliability like no overheating no record limit stuff like that sony was the one the only one that checked all those boxes for me and i was like sometimes sony fans can be aggressive <laughs> with yeah. how much they like sony and don't think you should use anything else and that kind of turned me away from it for a while um because i was like i don't want to be like this uh, sony guy yeah but they're just i bought the a7s3 i was like this camera's amazing then i got the fx3 then i got the a7 IV, and i i just went in I just went all in and they're and great. the lenses. Uh, yeah. The whole thing basically up until like when the a seven S three came out, it kind of, or honestly, I, th I think the ZV one came out before mm -hmm. the a seven S three. Yeah. Um, that was the first sign to me that I was like, Oh, wait a minute. They're actually listening to the YouTubers. Yeah. <laughs> flip <laughs> like, screens and the whole deal and product yeah, adding the showcase flip screen. mode. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, everything about the ZV one was like, if this came out three years ago when the vlogging thing was like huge, that would have sold like crazy. Yeah. Um, and then the a seven S three, I kind of know a little bit of like some insider stuff. Cause I had some friends that 
I know that were involved with some back end stuff with Sony and mm. they basically had the whole camera finished. Um, and then the YouTuber Casey Neistat thing kind of happened and mm. <clears throat> they realized like, we need to go back to the drawing board and wow. redo some stuff. So the a seven S three was actually finished around the time when like the a seven R three came out. And then the a seven, the a seven three came out. Yeah. Remember there was that kind of generation where they upgraded to the newer batteries mm-hmm. and yeah. the ca- slightly chunkier bodies. Um, but they added the flip screen. They put that full size HDMI on it. They um, enabled the raw, you know, kind of stuff. And yeah, um, K one twenty, the whole deal. K one, yeah, all that stuff. So um, and the the autofocus is like yeah. nuts now. So <laughs> in the main thing, <clears throat> and I think they clearly listened was the color like that was kind of the main thing for me being a canon user forever Mm -hmm. back with the 5d mark ii and you know we were shooting on the 5d and the 7d during the dslr revolution so i was used to that kind of canon color science and the c100 like you said too we i used that a lot for commercial stuff yeah um and loved it so it was either like we're gonna shoot on a red or an re if it's like a big thing and then we'll shoot on like a c100 c300 for like lower budget productions Mm -hmm. and then for weddings i'm gonna shoot on a 5d you know so yeah that was kind of the whole thing and it seemed pretty common and then people started switching over to sony the fs7 was pretty popular in the like freelance world the fs5 i had some friends that shot on that but even with those cameras even though they were cinema grade cameras I felt like the color still just wasn't there compared to, um, you know, even Canon C300. Yeah, Um, I agree. And uh, it was that A7S III that really um, triggered it. I was like, wait a minute, they fixed the color. The color is actually really good now. Like, it's nuts. And then I got to play with the the Sony Venice, um, the full frame 8K, whatever, you know, the the Venice um, (laughs) when I was at Indie Mogul. And we did a head to head with the A7S III and the Venice and the mm-hmm. Alexa. And my takeaway was actually the Alexa is obviously like in its own class because it's a different, completely it's different company. Different. Yeah. And it's amazing. Um, but I was so surprised how almost identically similar the A7S was to the Venice, which is a yeah. very expensive. <clears throat> massive cinema grade camera sony's Um, weird about that where it's like they'll come out with something and they'll just throw a feature in a lower end camera that like a higher end camera has or doesn't have and you're like like the four right the a7 four has um features that the a7s three doesn't have that make it better in some ways yes it does and i'm like praying for a firmware update (laughs) i'm sure it will i'm sure it'll. yeah it's crazy but it's it seems like I've, it seems like Canon with their customers, they they really like pushing people towards, you know, like you want these features. They kind of like push you up the product line, especially if you're into video into the cinema lineup to get to get the yeah. really good stuff. Yep. And Sony is just like use a Sony camera. We don't care. Like we don't care what Sony camera it is. Just <laughs> get into the ecosystem and then we got you. Um, and I feel like that's a very different approach between the two companies. But it, it well, really it's I, I feel like that's what's happening a lot well think about the heritage of both of the companies mm-hmm. canon nikon come from a long lineage of decades and de- you know of mm-hmm. of life i mean canon's been around forever um and they've been the massive titan uh forever so um sony had to basically just hustle their way up to become yeah. now the biggest brand well, they, in i mean mirrorless. sony's been doing video forever but god their mirrorless cameras they always had cool things and i always said mm-hmm. that like sony valued innovation at the cost of reliability and canon valued reliability at the cost of innovation was kind of how for a long for time a while yeah because sony like the, the original a7 it was like oh my gosh this camera can see in the dark it was um, tiny yeah it's tiny it's so good It overheats like crazy. The battery doesn't last at all. The autofocus is terrible. They had years of growing pain. The color sucks. Yeah. (laughs) Color sucks. Yeah. And it's like, I feel like they really paid their dues year after year, model after model of like finding these improvements and then getting to a point where it's like they figured it out and Mm. they were listening to their customers. And then Canon had been doing the thing that they'd been doing for a long time and suddenly was like, wow, we could do mirrorless. And it's like, oh, shoot, it's kind of hard. It's different. Like, 
Uh-oh. Also, we're like four years behind Sony now. Yeah, it seems like that's what happened. And, uh, you know, it's just it is what it is. And it's I was just so yeah. frustrated because I loved my Canon cameras and lenses. And I was like, Canon, you have all the pieces to this puzzle. Put it together. Like, why aren't you yeah. building the puzzle? And they really dropped the ball, in my opinion, because they owned the whole thing because they, they created it. the whole DSLR revolution. Yeah. And even during that period of time, it was frustrating. I don't know if you were you doing video in 2008. Oh, yeah. When oh, yeah, all yeah, that yeah. happened. Oh, okay. yeah. So, so, you know. So, yeah. Did, were you shooting on like camcorders and then you bought a 5D or? Yep. I had a Sony Handycam that. and then uh, I was able to use a 5D and then I bought, um, I had a XTI, but I bought the T2i when that came out because I could afford it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and well, oh I my bought God. This, I, I had the 7D because I couldn't afford the 5D Mark II, but the 7D I, was a big deal because I was wanted like, that one. Badly, it was super 35, you know, couldn't whatever. budget it. And it had 24 frames per second, which was a big deal at the time. Yeah. Oh, such a, <laughs> and, it, and it had the it had the flip dial. That was the first one with the photo it video was. like flip switch. That is You're a right. brilliant design. I wish they yeah, I think they're still using it on the R3 mm-hmm. um and on the the 90D. Actually, I was looking at the uh, uh, picking up a 90D, but I'm not going to buy a DSLR, but <laughs> Yeah. I think it's interesting that like the 90D is kind of like the ultimate 7D that I always wanted. 4K with good autofocus with a flip screen mm-hmm. um, with that video photo switch on it. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the whole ergonomics are great, but I think it'd be silly to buy a camera with a mirror in it right now. So. It's crazy, but yeah, and, and an older lens mount that yeah, great lenses exactly. that it's plenty of lenses for it, but there's not going to be new ones for it or anything. And my justification is I have a whole bunch because I'm using the turbo booster on the C70. So like, oh yeah, okay. I'm I'm kind of st- like it's frustrating with the C70. It's like a killer camera, uh, but it's super 35, and I want to use full frame, and so I have right. to use the turbo booster, which forces me to stick with the F, <laughs> which I don't want to do because it's too big and old, and yeah, you know. But that's the that's the kicker. But hopefully they'll start diversifying their uh camera lineup i think that's and their lenses they need to keep making more lenses yeah more third-party yeah. lenses i would love to see tamron and sigma oh, start making rf lenses i don't know why they haven't yeah i don't so. know why they're keeping that closed in and that's that's another thing that like I, learn learning like the sony ecosystem was like a whole new language because i'm so used to canon and the way they do things but a thing that i think is at least different i think it's interesting about sony is they don't really care about segmenting their cameras because canon has like their hybrid cameras and then their cinema cameras and that's that's kind of it um whereas sony has like you know like the seven series the a7 cameras you know the a7s yeah. these are video and they can do a little bit of photo the a7r these are photo they can do a little bit of video and the a7 can do a little bit of both but you know, not better at photo than this, not better at video than this. And then you just decide, like, if you're a video person, get the camera that's better at video and maybe you compromise on photo a little bit other way around. And like, you can decide as a user what you need. And I think that's pretty cool. It's pretty gutsy, you know, for a company to to, totally. to do that. But it, it, it works because you it's so hard to have a camera that can do everything all at once just like literally like physics makes it impossible (laughs) you know i want ibis and nd filters and no overheating and 80 megapixels and full it's like that would be great but (laughs) totally might not happen and you got to make your compromises the thing that um i don't like about the canon stuff is that it often forces me to have a bigger kit they don't really have a super dialed in small lightweight set up i mean mm-hmm. well i'm uh they do have those tiny little primes now that they're starting to make which yeah. is cool um but like i'm almost cons- like i'm talking about like an a6600 kind of oh, thing. okay okay yeah, yeah we have the the canon m50 lineup which those sold like crazy but mm-hmm. i feel like the efm mount is kind yeah. of dead so i would love to see canon make a bunch of rf uh rfs lenses and yeah. bodies if you will so like crop like, sensor r f mount because they're they've already said that their mirrorless is the future so like let's start seeing the rebel like yeah, equivalent yeah. you know in a mirrorless um, i mean body. obviously they have to do it at some point hopefully it's just sooner rather than later um because yeah that's that's a that's a big deal that is i guess a sony advantage is like all the lenses work on all the cameras 
I know. Isn't that that's <laughs> brilliant? It's a brilliant model. Yeah, um, I didn't I know, know that. And it it's it's awesome. Instead <laughs> of like I have EF, RF, EFS, M, and you're like, wait, okay, what works on what? Especially the yeah, the M fifty is amazing, but M lenses they're, <laughs> they're like non existent. <laughs> yeah. Except for those three great Sigma primes. Yeah, that of course Sigma made. came in and saved the day, but they sure did. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, I, I made a video about the C70, the things I didn't like about it. Um, but as I've been using it more and more, uh, for YouTube, I'm finding that I am enjoying it, um, uh, quite a bit. So I'm very pleased with it. And when I really kind of like overanalyze the whole situation, I don't want to give up the long battery life, the full size HDMI, the good audio inputs, the good preamps, the built in NDs, yeah, all those things that. that make it a great solid all, all around like YouTuber camera. Uh, it's awesome, especially just sitting here on a tripod. Like it's, it's really great. I don't have to worry about it overheating. Yeah. The autofocus works pretty good. So I feel like I've seen a lot of people who had the C70 and then, you know, they try out different cameras and review other ones. And then after a couple months, they seem to come back to the C70. <laughs> I haven't yeah. used it, but it seems like it's kind of the one that sticks around for a lot of people. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's kind of doing everything that I would want, sort of. It's just, if it was full frame, that would be it. But, oh, God, yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> it, would be cool. it is what it is. Um, so I wanted to ask you for uh, YouTube, like what are some strategic things that you've learned over the last couple of years that you've seen real results in, you know, like thumbnails? Yeah. Is there a certain way that you edit or, or the way that you kind of script your videos? Yeah. Give me some kind of, interesting things that you've picked sure. up along the way being a youtuber yeah i think there's a few um a big one is a couple years ago i started just putting stupid jokes and puns into my videos all over the place and prior to that i didn't my videos would be very like this is this microphone and it has an xlr it was very just matter of fact mm -hmm. but uh i love dumb jokes and stupid puns and like <laughs> i i you know i don't have kids but i love dad jokes and that was my high school classes that I taught were just that like I would do a joke that it was like just a not in a bad way like we still learn stuff but it was like a circus sometimes and that was <laughs> like what helped me build relationships because I don't care how tough like you know some 17 or 18 year old will like be stomping down the hall but if you're like man do you know why that bicycle fell over because it was too tired they're gonna be like <laughs> and like it, it's the thing that like helped me connect with students and with any student like all the time it's just the dumb jokes yeah, and they i roll their eyes like, but deep down they love it yeah exactly no, the joke is how bad the joke is like i'm not trying to yeah. tell a good joke <laughs> i'm trying to tell a really bad joke and that's what's funny um and i realized like youtube's the same thing i'm trying to win people over i'm trying to connect with them i'm trying to i don't know make them feel like they're enjoying something maybe i should mm -hmm. just tell a dumb joke in my video and so I started just putting like a, a dumb joke in every video and people immediately latched onto it. And then <laughs> it got to the point where it was like, you know, if I don't have a pun or a dumb joke every 90 seconds or something, people will like click off the video. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so in addition to like trying to structure a video that makes sense, I'm also like, what's a good Drawing piece of wordplay? <laughs> That's what I love when there's something like sure oh, the brand name itself is wordplay. So I can be like, I sure do love the Shure SM7B. It's unbelievable. Like it just, <laughs> it's like I have to just do that now. Um, but I love, that's how my brain works. So it's, it's cool. And it's every once in a while, I'll get the person who shows up and they're like, good review, but please stop with the stupid jokes. And it's like, this party's not for you, you know, and that's okay. But <laughs> yeah. I know that like the people who are connecting with the channel, they love that. And then they'll leave comments where they're, you know, they're making dumb jokes. And that's um, it, like, that is the thing that's helped me connect on a personal level with my audience, even if we don't know each other directly. Uh, and I, that worked for me. I'm not saying everyone needs to do dumb jokes, but like having a part of your personality really shine through is what makes you stand out because people could get the info anywhere. They just go to the manufacturer's YouTube channel and get the technical info. But you know, you have something, maybe that's being super hyped and animated. Maybe that's being super chill and laid back or a dumb joke or being hyper technical, like whatever a person's thing might be. I think that's something to really, really embrace and showcase. And it definitely helped me connect a lot. 
um, a lot. And that's awesome. Yeah, it, it has. It, it's been really, really cool. And so I try now, I try this to start every video. Like the hook of every video is quick, quick intro. I don't need to tell you, you know, my life story before we get into the video. Quick 15 second intro, 10 second intro that just explains like, you know, the sure SM7B has been a king since 1974 and the RE20 has been since 1969. Let's put these two mics together. Like, Here's what the video is going to be about, but also there's going to be some dumb jokes and wordplay in that first 10 seconds. It's going to like set the tone for everything. Yeah. Um, and that's helped. It's hard. It's like the hardest part of the video to write. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> uh, but that's where like a lot of calories get burned. Um, yeah. And that has helped. And then the other thing that's been kind of a big revelation over the past year has been how I'm like framing what I'm doing. Because you know, I started making videos about audio and stuff and I like it. So it's, it's fun to get a microphone, do a mic comparison, do that. And I started kind of getting people going like, this is cool, but like, I already got my microphone. I don't need another microphone video. I don't need this. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. Vary it a little bit. Sure. Um, but what I started realizing was in this niche, whether it's audio, video, photo, filmmaking, whatever, it's big, there's a big audience, but it is also, it's a pretty niche subject or niche, however you want to pronounce it. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think I've seen lots of people feel like their views are down, their motivations down, their audience isn't as enthusiastic as they used to be. And part of that is, I think it is saturated. Like a lot of years were spent teaching people how to shoot good video and get good audio. And now a lot of people know how to do that. And like, they don't need another video about the exposure triangle because <laughs> they got it, you know, but there's still people out there who do need that stuff, but they don't know that they need it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, one thing, for example, like, okay, we'll talk about mic boosters. I could make a video that says like fat head versus cloud lifter and people who know they're looking at a fat head or a cloud lifter will click on that video. But if they don't know about that, why would you, it's sounds like the weirdest words I've ever combined is the, the yep. doesn't even make sense. And so saying like, is your mic too quiet? That's a great title for a video because someone's going to go like, yeah, my mic isn't loud enough. And then they'll watch the video and then they'll learn about boosters and then they'll learn about one that might be a good choice for them. So it's like mm. taking the niche idea and and giving it a really broad frame. Like, so mm. it's not, you know, Deity V07U mic review, but it's like a budget podcasting kit, like or something, yeah. you know, the perfect creator podcasting kit okay what's that and you know it, it's a little there's a little mystery to it it's yeah. a little broad but it, people kind of connect with it and then they learn what it's about and of course the thumbnail ties into that and I've, I've been trying really hard to just like big bold and simple like a billboard you know you you only have a few seconds I know that's like the most <laughs> cliche no. YouTube advice in the world but I was putting so much text on my thumbnails and I thought it from a design standpoint looked really good. And then I realized good thumbnail design isn't always good graphic design. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you're taught. Yeah. Yeah. Like I know that this is technically perfect, but if I'm scrolling through the person has to like stop and attempt to figure it out and they're not going to do that. So I need something that's just like best microphone, big arrow pointing to it and like, okay, yeah. let's do this. Try to figure out the least words you can use. Yeah, or no you know, words or whatever, you know. Or just, none, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Questions help a lot. Um, making definitive statements using words like perfect or almost perfect. Um, you know, because if you say like like the GoPro, the GoPro Hero 10 is practically perfect. People are going to either be curious or have opinions. <laughs> and then yeah, they're, they're going like, to. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and deliver on it i like definitely don't clickbait it i know that we, i've heard that on this show many times like the same basic discussion like it's not clickbait if you are delivering on the thing that's pulling the person in uh, but mm -hmm. you got to make it interesting you know like we mentioned peter lindgren a while ago he's got his vlog channel that um that he's been like having a ton of fun with and it's been growing like crazy and he's he leans real heavily into like clickbait titles <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's like i can't believe this happened or this changes everything or whatever and it's always something you know like I got a new coffee maker in the studio. It changes everything. It's always something little, but mm. the videos do well. And then he did a week or two ago, he did one video that was like not clickbait. It was like building my office or you just 
it is what the video is. And it was, you know, his worst performing video. And he posted a thing that was something like you all say you don't want clickbait, but my non clickbait video is the worst performing video. So <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, everybody's different. And I don't know, I think if, if you're trying to take YouTube seriously, like you can't like be too um uh what's the romantic about Mm -hmm. how you're gonna do it i mean if you want to just be an artist and be okay with just doing your art the way that you believe it should be done then that's fine but um this is a kind of a game in a way and you got to figure out what works and what changes and it yeah and it, it's it goes in waves yeah yeah it goes in waves stuff that used to work didn't work that's why i'm always interested in creators like Marquez Brownlee, I just seen like the people I know they're huge, but they've been around through so Mm -hmm. many versions of YouTube and they've managed to adapt and evolve and still do what they've always done, but do it in a way that like is still relevant. And that to me is like very fascinating and very obviously it's something like I'm going to have to do if I want to keep doing this for a long time. And I, I think there's a lot to learn from those creators who have managed to stick around and evolve without losing the thing that makes them who they are that's actually a great point that you made the the multiple versions or the multiple generations of youtube Mm -hmm. with somebody like i justine i've been wanting to i still haven't asked her to be on i i would love to have her on i'm friends with her so that's actually a great like title for i would love to hear her can i have that that. yes can i have that title Take it because I want to hear the episode because I want you to hear what she said. I think that would be great to like discuss how she really has lived through every generation of YouTube and every version of it. Mm-hmm. And it, it is interesting how she's maintained her relevancy throughout the whole thing. It's it's yeah. crazy. She still does her like her channel is doing really well. She's still like her videos from today versus 10 years ago or beyond. Like it still feels like her, but yep. it's very different. She, and I know, you know, I've heard her talk about on episodes on things about, you know, it's really hard some days and I don't want to make a video and I have, you know, I know there's the struggle behind it. It's not easy, but um, oh yeah, clearly there's, there's an understanding there that not a lot of people have. And that's real interesting. If you could change one thing about YouTube, uh, you had a magic wand. What, what would you change? Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. I know this is a, um, you know what? Here's a simple one. Actually, there's probably a lot, but I would love if YouTube studio were modular and you could like take the ah, little widgets yeah. and move them around or collapse them or make a custom window for yeah, yourself. Well, yeah. Yeah. All and your some, favorites. You know, sometimes I don't, you know, when you log into YouTube studio and you see your current video performance, sometimes I don't want to know that my video is 10 out of 10. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't need the graphic of a, b- a balloon deflating. Like yeah. maybe, maybe I could just close that out for this week and not look at that. Or, um, <laughs> You know, like comments are a big one because I I try to reply to a lot of comments. And so I go through as often as I can and reply. And then if if some are really rude or wrong, I just delete them or ban the person. But every once in a while, there's a comment that's like, I'm not going to delete it, but I'm not going to reply to it. But it doesn't make me feel great. And then I log into YouTube Studio. And because I haven't done anything with it, Uh it's the one that I keep seeing (laughs) like every time I log in. So being able to like, block that out or move that out just like being able to control what info i see you know and and there might be something you're focusing on if you've changed your ad settings like if you've started using mid rolls or stopped using them or whatever and you want to know how your revenue is like really changing being able to throw up a little revenue window in youtube studio like right on your dashboard would be super cool like really being able to customize it because there's so much good info there, but sometimes That's I actually a great don't want to see it. Or for my own mental health, I don't need to be told how my audience is less interested in this video than usual. <laughs> Can you tell me about this thing that I just now discovered because I searched your name, Teacher of the Year, <laughs> Tom Buck? I didn't Uh-oh. realize that I was speaking to the Teacher of the Year. Yes, yes. My speaking fee is very large. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what's that? That was, that was crazy. Um, so shoot, what was it? In 2018, I was voted, there were three teachers of the year. Every school does like teacher of the year. So I was a teacher of the year at my school, which is super cool. Uh, and then in 2019, if you're teacher of the year at your school, you got to, 
then go in this running to be like for your school district. So in 2019, I got named teacher of the year for my district, which was ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> um, and then if you're teacher of the year for the district, you get to go for running for the county, um, which is crazy because there's like 22,000 teachers in my county. And uh, I got I was teacher of the year for the county in 2020, Dude. Uh, which was nuts. <laughs> and they they did like they had a whole film crew come and do like a little bio piece, which is super cool. They had a whole production van mm -hmm. and like easy You're rigs. And, and they gave you a, a check for a million dollars, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it, it sure paid a lot <laughs> or, or nothing. They gave me a really nice bouquet of flowers and a cool plaque. <laughs> um, I got a letter from <laughs> That's the senator. Awesome, that was cool. It was I mean, it was pretty amazing, That's amazing. Like, to get that because they interviewed like coworkers, they interviewed students, they interviewed parents. So it it wasn't it really felt like, wow, like people kind of care about what I'm doing. And it's cool because I was teaching digital media. So it's like it kind of also recognized that like making movies and being good with audio as actually being important. Yeah, uh, so that was cool. And then um, so through that, I got to be in like the final running for a California state teacher of the year. And then I lost. <laughs> so uh, okay. that's as far as I got. Well. <laughs> that's okay that's still pretty amazing <laughs> and i'll link the video it's like a four minute video um i think it's the is it the one that's rcoe tv is that the channel that, yeah riverside county office of education which like the the county education office has this amazing production crew and they were like they were the cool they had, you know drones it's really and well shot. cameras and they Looking were at it right good now. like and they let my students use everything you know, they were bringing oh, in like cool. Aperture 300 Ds and all this crazy <laughs> rigging and stuff. And it was like, they're like, we got insurance. Sure. Like, who cares if a kid, <laughs> no student broke anything. Everyone took care of it. But they were like, if it breaks, we have insurance. Like, let the kid shoot on the crazy cinema camera. It's like, thank you. That's, That's amazing. how it should be. I mean, you're, you're, you're a year now being a YouTuber. What is it that you miss about being a teacher? Uh, not the paperwork or the politics or the system or any of that. Um the thing I miss is the the connection. The program I I ran, which was cool because I got to start it. So I got to like create my own job and is a four year program. So students would be in it for either three or four years. And it's like by the time you've worked with them for that long, like we would travel and they'd be in competitions and their work would be shown in theater sometimes or on TV. And you'd see them go from being like literally like a punk ninth grader who was just like this class is stupid and you know, whatever, and I'd give him a canon rebel or something um, to then being a senior who's like, you know, I'm thinking that I need to buy a canon EOS R, but I don't know if I should get the RF mount like they it, they totally get hooked and they <laughs> they start even, you know, like booking their own clients in 11th or 12th grade. They start yeah. um, they start kind of finding a passion or a voice they didn't know they had. And That's awesome. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that they go to school for it or or whatever, but they I feel like when you're good at making videos, you're good at communicating, you're good at problem solving, you're good at tech stuff. And all of that is going to help you no matter what you end up doing. And it's like, it's so cool to see that, to, to just be able to introduce somebody to that and then kind of mm -hmm. like encourage them along the way and um, can still do that to an extent through YouTube in a different way. But it's very different when it's like every day we're just in person you're investing that. in kids' lives. I mean, you really become a friend and a mentor. So yeah, yeah it's a it's a very um, it's a pretty special thing. Our my school was not like a well. It sounds wealthy. We're like we got all these cameras and stuff. We were actually a, a very low income area. Um, fortunately, the state just had good funding for this stuff. But um, so it's like a lot of kids came from really rough home lives and lack of parents, lack of support, abuse, all that stuff. And it's like they could wow. find something that that they connected with in a really meaningful way and that they, they got confidence from and it was all free to them. They didn't have to pay for it. They didn't have to pay for the wow. equipment. They didn't have to pay for the trips. Like it, it really like a lot of them had never left the little area that we live. Like they've never gone past our mountains, even though we're a couple hours from the beach, like they've never seen the beach and through the program, oh, wow. they would travel on airplanes, meet, you know, I don't know, famous people be in movie studios and <laughs> well, it, it they, really brought teacher their, of the year. Yeah, that's the biggest draw, you know, is being a teacher of the year. <laughs> yeah, well, so that, that I miss that a lot. Well, I, f I feel like there's still a route for you to still 
kind of do all that. I, I can understand why you would leave because unfortunately the way that the American school system, especially in the public school system God. is laid out is just a mess. It's awful. It's like, you it's, don't want to be involved broken. in that. It's just totally broken. Like the the time I got to spend teaching was so small compared to the time I was doing everything else. But, um, you know, and that YouTube is really the best way. And of course, you can do courses like I, you know, put together courses. I'd love to do like a live cohort kind of a course one day. <clears throat> um, yeah. But, you know, you'll be good at it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. It's there's an itch. I like explaining stuff. I like connecting with people. But I think YouTube and the internet really does let you do that in a pretty magical way. And if the world ever opens back up, being able to like go to events or participate in like this kind of industry conferences and events would be really fun and connect with people with these people in real time would be would be pretty awesome. So that's kind of stuff I'm looking forward to. Well, Tom, I think we could probably talk for another <laughs> yeah, two hours about was... gear and stuff, but it's getting late for me. It's 10 30 yeah. PM over here. So, and it's, uh, it's not, it's eight, it's eight 30 for you. So that's not too bad, but, um, Tom, it was a real pleasure meeting you and talking yeah. to you on this, uh, podcast. Um, yeah, thanks everybody so much goes, for having me. This was surreal. I loved it. <laughs> Dude, it, it humbles me to know that because to me, it's just <laughs> a, just like you showing up and doing your YouTube channel. It's like, I'm in a room by myself right, right. now, you know, like so glamorous, <laughs> <laughs> so glamorous, but yeah, go everybody go check out Tom Buck. If you do, aren't already a subscriber, it's just uh, T O M B U C K. Super easy and name. Yeah. Super like. easy. You didn't have to change it like I did um, nope. to a stage name. So very clever. Did I just reveal that? You knew that that wasn't my name, right? I did. Yes, I did know that. And <laughs> yeah, when I, once I realized the YouTube URL for my name was available, I was like, that's what I'm using because it's spelled Dude, like it sounds. That's amazing <laughs> that your URL was available too. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. All right, everybody go follow Tom Buck. Thank you, Tom, for being on the show. And uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Time. This was awesome. <laughs>